come here and to study your word. Lord, we lift up to you all of the needs on our prayer list. Lord, we just pray that you would work in each person's life according to your will. And God, we pray that, uh, that you would work in our church, those that are sick, uh, that don't feel good today, Lord, those that are uh, hurting. Um, and for whatever other reasons, Lord, they weren't able to be here or they weren't able to be here Sunday, Lord, we pray that you would be with them and that you would strengthen them and you would draw them back here. Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with us tonight as we study your word. Lord, we pray that you would take these, uh, these deep truths about the priesthood of Christ and that you would put them in our hearts and you would let them encourage us and motivate us to be people of prayer and to be uh, people who fix our eyes on Christ and look to him. Lord, we pray that you would be with us tonight and help us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we're going to be in Hebrews 7. And I told you last week uh, when we looked at Psalm 110 that this is kind of a, a precursor to the book of Revelation. That Revelation isn't really necessarily about the future events, but it's really a, an unveiling of what Christ is doing now in His glory. And we need to have a basic understanding of what Jesus is doing right now in His duty as our high priest, that He prays for us, that He offers uh, prayers to God on our behalf, He intercedes for us, He gives us strength, um, and, and, and those kinds of things. And so we're going to see in Hebrews 7 tonight the importance of this role that Jesus does, and, and we're going to focus in on attributes of Jesus. So, in the Old Testament, extremely important, was absolutely vital. Um, they, they were the, the ones who were given the responsibility to make sacrifices on behalf of the people's sins. Right? No priest, no sacrifice, no forgiveness. That was the way it worked in the Old Testament. And because of this, they, the priest had a, a high position. They were exalted, they were looked at as, as, as very important, and so important that you could only be a priest if you were of a specific bloodline. Right? You had to be of the tribe of Levi, and even in the tribe of Levi, there were family units, and each of those family units served a different purpose. Right? So one family might uh, carry the tent pegs for the tabernacle, and one family might carry the Ark of the Covenant, and one family would carry the, the table of showbread, and, and they each had a different task. And then one special priest, called the high priest, was the one that would make the, the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Well, when the tabernacle was gone and they built a temple, Solomon re-signed a lot of those duties to people in the temple to do different tasks because you can't pack up a temple and carry it, right? So, so they didn't have a task to do anymore. Um, and, and so they had specific uh, chores and, and services that they did. And, and all of it ultimately was in service of the high priest. They were helping the high priest in his one main duty of offering sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for the people. Where he would go in once a year in the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of top of the Ark of the Covenant. And he would wear on his chest, um, he would have stones, it was 12 stones, one representing each of the tribes of Israel. And so he would bear the, the people, he would represent them into the presence of God when he would go in and make the atonement for them. Now, when we get to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is making the point and the argument that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than all of the Old Testament practices, all of the rituals and the ceremonies and the sacrifices and the priesthood. Jesus is better than all of it. He's better than a temple. He's better than everything. And, and all of it ultimately is an example. It's like a picture book that points ahead to Jesus coming. That's what the Old Testament was. That's what all of those ceremonies and all of those things were. And an example of this would be the thing I told you the high priest wore into the, tent, into the Holy of God, with the, the stones on it that represented all the, the people of God. Jesus did the same thing for us. He represented us into the presence of God when He took His blood and put it on the actual mercy seat before the throne of God when He ascended up to heaven. And so Jesus represented us as our high priest. And so earthly picture of a heavenly thing that Jesus actually did. And it all points ahead to, to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. And so that's the point of the book of Hebrews, and that's number one on your paper. The point of the book of Hebrews is to teach us that Jesus is better than all the Old Testament people, rituals, and sacrifices. That Jesus is better. In the beginning of Hebrews, it starts off by telling us how Jesus is better than angels. It was angels a lot of times in the early parts of the Bible that communicated to people. Right, we see an angel coming talking to Moses. We see angels coming and um, saving Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. And so he makes the argument, Jesus is better than angels. 
He makes the argument that Jesus is better than Moses. That Jesus is better than the Sabbath rest. Chapter 4 tells us that Jesus is better than the high priest. He's, he's better than all of the priests. He's better than Melchizedek. We looked at that last week in Psalm 110. Chapter 8 tells us that Jesus is the bringer of a better covenant. In chapter 9, He's a better sanctuary. Right? He's the greater temple. Jesus is where we find the true rest from our works. It's in Christ that we have the true Sabbath. Uh, Jesus is the perfect sanctuary. He's the place where we meet God. And it's only through Him that we can meet God. And so this is the point of the book of Hebrews. So if I was to do a study, which I, we will one day go through the book of Hebrews, the title of it would probably be Jesus is Better. Because that's really the point of the book. Now, when we get to Hebrews 7, the writer of Hebrews is making an argument. So in the early church, the majority, or at least half, of the converts to the church, of Christianity, were Jews. And in the Jewish mindset, the temple and the priests and the sacrifices and all of these things were essential. They were absolutely important. That's why there was the whole big debate about circumcision in the early church, because they thought this was absolutely necessary to be a child of Abraham. You have to follow all of these ceremonies and all of these rituals. And so the writer of Hebrews is making this argument to break that down in their mind and say, no, Jesus is better than all these things. All these things are shadows and types. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment. He's the reality. And and so the argument goes like that. Well, when we get to chapter 7, the argument is that Jesus is the great high priest, even though he's not from the right tribe or the right bloodline or the right family. He's still the high priest, and he's the best high priest because he's after a different priesthood of Melchizedek which is what we looked at last week in Psalm 110. Now, here's how the argument goes. All right? so, so it's a logical train of thought. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham because Abraham paid homage to Melchizedek. In Genesis 16, at the, after Abraham defeated all the kings, Melchizedek shows up and he pays a tithe to him, deferring to Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Levi, where all of the priests come from, is less than Abraham. So if Abraham is less than Melchizedek, then so is all of the people who come from Levi, which means all of the priests are less than Melchizedek. And Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek, so he's greater. Then he goes into the argument to say, Jesus is actually greater than Melchizedek. Alright, so that's the flow of thought of, of Hebrews 7. So, the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the Levite's priesthood, but Jesus is greater than him. And so, number two... And your notes is this. The point of Hebrews 7 is that Jesus is the perfect and final high priest. He is the perfect and final high priest. That's the conclusion that we're left with. Jesus is the greatest. He's the ultimate. Now, now that we know what he's saying, we'll read our text. We're going to read verses 23 to 28. And then we'll look at, uh, at, at our high priest and, and how it describes Jesus here. So it says, And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, Jesus, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens." who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law makes men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son who is consecrated forevermore. Alright, so that's the text. So the first part is we see the permanent priest. Jesus is the permanent priest. He is of an unchanging priesthood. So, In verse 23, he reminds us of those priests from the book of Leviticus, right? From the tribe of Levi. That these men were made priests, but they all died. And because they died, another priest had to come up in their place. And they always had this expectation that there was a revolving door of priests because everyone died, right? But, verse 24, this man, Jesus, continues forever. Therefore, He is an unchangeable priesthood. His priesthood doesn't end. We're not looking for another. Jesus is the final. He's the ultimate. He's the perfect priest. Right? And so in eternity past, God the Son, we have to remember this, He was not a man. Right? He says, but this man, because He continues ever, 
Jesus was not always a man. In eternity past, Jesus was a spirit like the Father and like the Holy Ghost. But Jesus agreed with the Father and with the Holy Spirit that He would take on flesh in His earthly life and that He would come and He would die for us. Jesus became a man. He died. He rose from the dead bodily, right? And then He ascended to heaven bodily and we know that He's going to return physically to the earth one day in the second coming. All the while, He is a man. And one day, He will set up His kingdom, His throne, on the new earth as a man. Right? 1 Timothy 2.5, we have one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is a man, and He will always be a man. And so that's number three. The eternal Son of God became a man for the rest of eternity to serve as our high priest forever. That's an amazing truth to think about what Jesus did. That... This wasn't just something He did for a moment. He gave up being a spirit with the Father and the Holy Spirit to become a man, to take on flesh forever. And He did that so that He could die for us, so that He could relate to us in our weaknesses and strengthen us, and so that He could serve as our high priest. Hebrews chapter 2 says this. It says, For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He was made like us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, and is able to support them that are tempted. Because Jesus became a man, he endured temptation like we do. And because he did that, he can strengthen us in our weakness. He's a man that lives forever. And so, he is a high priest forever by virtue of an unending life. Right? There is no replacement. There is no plan B. No one that we're looking for after Him. This means that there is one man who mediates for us. One man who stands in the gap between us and God. So we don't need a priest class to go to God for us. This is why uh, we don't have confession booths in our church. Right? This is why you don't come to me when you sin and then I have to go to God for you. It doesn't work that way. You go to Jesus. You go straight to the man yourself because He is the one that stands in the gap between you and God. Now, Peter tells us that we are called to be a royal priesthood. But what Peter means there is that we are all priests in the service to the great high priest. Just like in the Old Testament, how the priests all had different services and functions, all in order to support the high priest to do his one duty, that's what we do. We serve as royal priesthood to the great king priest, Jesus. And that's what our our Baptist distinctive is. That's something that separated Baptists throughout church history is the idea of the priesthood of all believers. right? Because a lot of other denominations, and even the Catholics, have a clergy class. They have a priest class that are above the people. But we see in the Bible that that's not true. There's only one priest that's above us, and that's Jesus. The rest of us are all priests under Him. right? We have pastors and deacons, but you don't come to me to talk to God. I'm not the middleman. Jesus is. And so, you can pray to Him just like me, or just like uh, Lynn, or, or anybody else that's in a leadership role. This is, by the way, why we reject the idea of the Pope. Right? The, the Pope calls himself the Vicar of Christ, which means he claims to stand in the place of Jesus on earth, that he stands between us and God, and that he has authority over the church. We reject that, because Jesus is priest forever because he has an unending life. And he's been exalted to the right hand of the Father so that he can serve as high priest forever continually. Only Jesus can go into that place. And only Jesus can stand before God. And so we don't need another man to stand up for the rest of us. We have Christ. He's the all-sufficient Savior. And He is the great High Priest. And because He lives forever, we know that He is able to save us. So then He goes on in verse 25. He says, Wherefore, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. He is able to save us to the uttermost. He, He is able to save us those who come to God by Him, which is the only way to come to God, is by Jesus. Now, that word uttermost, it means fully, perfectly, or to the most extensive degree. Jesus saves us fully, completely. And that's number four. He saves us completely because He accomplished everything the sinner needs to be made right with God. Everything the sinner needs, Jesus has accomplished it. Jesus paid it all. His Death paid for our debt, and His righteousness gives us a right standing with God. And so He has saved us to the uttermost. All of our past, all of our future sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. 
It's also in the present tense. Jesus currently serves as our priest right now. He is all we need. He is enough. He saves all who come to God by Him. Now, in, in the Old Testament, they needed to have this constant succession of priests. Their priests would die and they had to replace them. And so they were always waiting. But we're not. We already have the ultimate reality of the great high priest. All of the things that those high priests pointed to, we live under that. It is a reality for us. Which is exactly where it goes at the end of verse 25. It says, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to plead on our behalf. And so number five is this. Because Jesus rose from the dead and lives forever, he will always be there to intercede for us. Jesus told the disciples that he prayed for them. Remember that? When he was about to be arrested and he told Peter, Satan has come that he wanted to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. He just thought, if I heard Jesus pray for me, like John 17, right? If I heard Jesus pray for me, I'd face 10,000 men and not be afraid, right? But Jesus does pray for me. And He prays for you. And that should be an encouragement to our heart. He's praying for us right now. He prays for us when we sin. He prays for us when we're in temptation. He prays for us when we need boldness. He prays for us in desperation. When we're in need, He is beside the Father pleading on our behalf for God to look at us and show us favor. And you know Jesus always has the ear of God. God always listens to Jesus' prayer, right? And He's praying for us. And so that should be an encouraging thing. I don't know if y'all have heard the hymn, Before the Throne of God. Y'all know that hymn? It's not, I don't think it's in our Baptist hymnal. I'm going to read you a couple of lines from it because it's perfect for this. It says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. And that's what Hebrews 7 is teaching us. We have this great high priest who's before the throne of God and we can come to that throne and seek help in time of need. And, and when we sin, when we're in temptation, when we're in despair, when we're in need, and he's there. And so a couple of things that this should do for us. Letter A, this should give us boldness to go to Him in prayer. It should give us boldness in prayer. Courage to come to Him. That I can walk up to the throne of God. That I can come into the very presence of the Father. And I know Jesus is going to be there saying, this one's mine. This one's mine. Hear Him. And so that should give us boldness to come to Him. Because we're not alone. We're escorted into the presence of God by the Son of God. So we should make our requests known to Him. Letter B, we should go to Him in our times of temptation and expect His help. It should give us courage and boldness in temptation to know that He's there praying for us. Right? This is Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. It should give us boldness to know that Jesus is there pleading on our behalf. And it's a sad reality when we don't pray, when we don't go boldly to the throne. You know, Jesus went more willingly to the cross than we do to the throne of grace, and that's sad. We should draw near to God because of what Jesus has done. Right? First John, we have an advocate with the Father. That when we sin, we know that we have an advocate with the Father who pleads our case for us. We have an adversary, we have an accuser, we have the devil who goes to God and accuses us, but we have an adversary with Christ who pleads our case. You know, God isn't bothered by our constant coming to Him. The way we trouble God is to not come at all. And so we should go to God in boldness and prayer. And this is letter C. We should draw near to God in full assurance of faith that we will be accepted in Christ. We should come with full assurance of faith. Hebrews 10, 22 and 23 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure, pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Because He's a worthy high priest. He is a perfect priest. 
So that's the next part. In verses 26 through 28, we see the perfect priest. We see the perfect priest. He starts off in verse 26 and he says, For such an high priest became us. Now, he doesn't mean he became a man like us. We, we know that's true, but that's not what he means there. Became us means to be fitting. It's like we say, um, if you see a lady and she has filthy language come out of her mouth, you say, that doesn't become you, right? So that's what it's saying there. It's not fitting for you. It's saying Jesus was fitting for us. He was the proper priest. He was the one that we needed. Jesus is the high priest that became us. He is the one that is adequate to be our high priest. He is exactly what we needed. He is the only priest that can save us because He's the only holy, righteous, higher-than-heaven priest. And so, Jesus is a better priest than the Old Testament priests because, letter A, He's holy. He's free from sin. So under number six, letter A is, is free. He is free from sin. He is holy. He is spotless. He willingly gave Himself, both as our priest and as our spotless sacrifice. He doesn't have a single sinful inclination because He's holy. The second one is, He's harmless. He's free from all transgression. And so letter B is harmless. He never wronged anyone. Isaiah 53, 9 says, And He made His grave with the wicked and with the rich in His death, because He had done no violence, neither was any deceit in His mouth. He was harmless. He never wronged a person or God. He was undefiled. He was never an accomplice to another person's sin. And so letter C is undefiled. He's the blessed man of Psalm 1, right? The one who never took counsel with the ungodly or stood in the place of sinners or sat in the seat of the scornful. Now there's a distinction we have to make here. Jesus was the friend of sinners. We see that in the Gospels. He befriended prostitutes and drunkards and demon-possessed people and, and tax collectors and all those things, right? But Jesus wasn't there with them in their sin. He was there to draw them out and bring them to repentance. Jesus was undefiled. He wasn't sitting in the living room while the prostitute did her deed with some man in the bedroom. Jesus wasn't there holding the coat for some man so he could go get drunk, right? Jesus wasn't the designated driver, right? That, that's not what he was. He was the friend of sinners in that he was calling them out of their sin to righteousness, not holding their hand while they did the sin. He was totally perfect. He is totally perfect. And he's separate from sinners. He's separate from sinners because not only because he's in heaven now, separate from us, but also in his personal purity. He's separate. He never partook of a sin nature, right? Jesus was born of a virgin, which means he never inherited a sin nature from Adam. He never inherited a sin nature from his father. Yet, he was fully man. And so he, he did not have a sin nature. He didn't have a twisted, corrupt nature that was bent towards, towards wrongdoing. And so letter D is, he's separate from sinners. He is pure and has no sin nature. He is pure. He's the only one that can truly lay claim to Psalm 24, right? Who can come into the presence of God? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Only Jesus can walk into the presence of God because He's the only one with a pure heart. And then He says, He's made higher than the heavens. So this could mean two different things. And I think both of them are true, but I'm not sure which one the writer of Hebrews meant. But, but both of these things are true. So first, he's higher than the heavens could be a reference that Christ has been exalted to the right hand of God, right? Philippians 2, that he's been exalted so high that his name is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord, right? So it could mean that, or it could be a reference to how great his holiness is, that his holiness is even greater than all the hosts of heaven, that he doesn't have a holiness that was given to him like the angels. The angels don't have their own inherent holiness. They receive what they have from God. But the Son, Jesus, He has His own holiness. And so that's letter E. Higher than the heavens, He is exalted by God and is holy by nature. He's holy by nature. He is intrinsically holy. It's who He is. So He is holy, He has always been holy, and He will always be holy. In His divine nature, there was no chance of Christ failing. There was no chance of Him falling into sin because He's holy. He's higher 
than the heavens. So, he's shown us why Jesus is better than the other priests. And now he's going to show us why the priesthood of Jesus is better. So, not just that Jesus the man is better than all of the priests of the Old Testament, but that the covenant that Jesus serves under is better than that other covenant. So in verse 27, he says, still talking about Jesus, who needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for his people's. For he did once when he offered up himself. So Jesus is a greater high priest because he doesn't have to offer sacrifices every day. In the Old Testament, they were offering sacrifices seven days a week. They had to go in there and they had to first make a sacrifice for themselves to purify themselves before they could do the rest of the things that they needed to do for all the people. And they had to do this constantly. But Jesus Himself is sinless, and so He doesn't need to sacrifice something on His behalf to purify Himself and to cleanse Himself. And this to show us how great His love is. The priests in the Old Testament, they did their service for the people, but they also did it for themselves, because it was the only way they could be forgiven. But Jesus didn't gain anything from this. Outside of, of having a people, He could have created that. He had the angels. He didn't gain anything from that. He wasn't doing this for himself, the sacrifice on his behalf. He was already holy. So Christ made the sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. His sacrifice wasn't from the blood of another or from an animal. It was from himself. He gave his own sinless, perfect blood as our sacrifice. And it's a complete covering, right? It covers our sin totally. It's perfect. It's once forever. And it's done. And this is why the priesthood of Jesus is better than those of the Old Testament. So letter A is this. His priesthood is better because His sacrifice is better. The sacrifice that Jesus makes is better than any sacrifice made in the Old Testament. Because the the blood of bulls and goats can't actually take away sin. That's why they had to keep doing it over and over and over and over. And this is what it says in Hebrews 10, 12, and 14. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering he's perfected us forever. Jesus' sacrifice not only paid our sin debt in his passive obedience of dying on the cross, but he won our righteousness and our salvation in his active obedience, in his righteousness. So Jesus took the punishment for us, that's his passive obedience, he died on the cross, obeying the will of the Father, But He also, in the righteousness that He did through His life, earned our righteousness and gave it to us. This is where the Catholics and the Lutherans get messed up. Specifically on their teaching of the Lord's Supper. They'll say that the bread and the wine literally are turned into the body and the blood of Christ. And that He is sacrificed again and again every time they take the Lord's table, every time they do the Lord's Supper. And so they are effectively crucifying Jesus every Sunday when they do communion. But that's blasphemy, right? Christ's sacrifice on the cross was once for all time. We just read it in Hebrews 10. By one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It's a once for all time thing. But the Catholics have to teach that, otherwise they won't be able to have priests. What are their priests going to do if our high priest has already made the ultimate sacrifice, right? But Jesus is the perfect Savior. He's the perfect priest. He's the perfect sacrifice. And it's once for all time. And he goes in, and that's what verse 27 is telling us. He doesn't have to offer sacrifices daily like those other high priests. He did it once for all time. So his sacrifice was better. And then verse 28, he says, For the law makes men high priests which have infirmity, but by the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son consecrated forevermore. Now, it's a confusing sentence to just read it. So, I'm going to break it down into four parts. So, the priests of the Old Testament, they were sinners. They had weakness. They died. But God made a promise. He made an oath that there would one day come a better priest, another priesthood, and that it would be His Son, right? This is what we read in Psalm 110. And so, letter B is this. His priesthood is better because... Old Testament priests had weaknesses and died, but Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. He's not some mortal man 
who is high priest, he is the eternal Son of God. And so that makes his priesthood better because it's based on a man who is the Son of God, who is eternal. And then he says, but the word of the oath, which was since the law. Now, the word of the oath is referring to a promise that God made. I think it's specifically talking about Psalm 110, but it could be talking about a couple other passages. It's a promise that someone would come that would be greater. It wasn't based on commandments. It was based on a promise, which makes it better than a commandment. And so letter C is this, because Jesus' priesthood is based on promises, not law. That is why it's better. That is why it's better. Promises. It's plural. Hebrews 8.6 says this, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So Jesus is a better high priest because he is over a covenant that's better. And it came after the law, so it's greater than the law. If the priesthood of Aaron was perfect, and the sacrifices of the animals were perfect, then why would God make a promise that something else was to come? Obviously, those things weren't perfect. They weren't the final. They weren't God's ultimate end. There was something else. And then he says that he makes the son this priest. And so letter D is this. It's because Jesus is the son of God. He is a better priesthood because he is the son of God. He is greater than the Old Testament priests simply because he is the son of God. He's divine. He's set apart forever. It says at the end, he is consecrated forevermore. That means he's been set apart. He's been anointed as the high priest forever. But that wasn't true for the, whole, for the priests in the Old Testament, right? We've been saying this over and over. They died, and someone else had to come take their place. But Jesus has been set apart forever. And it's all ultimately because it was the eternal plan of God, which is letter E. Because Jesus' priesthood is the eternal plan of God. It is the eternal plan of God. <clears throat> now, we need to understand this. The Old Testament system didn't fail. A lot of times we think, well, God tried something by giving these commandments and these rituals and these sacrifices. He, he attempted this, and we messed it up, or messed it up, and so He had to come up with something else. But that is not true. The plan the entire time was that Jesus would come and that He would set up this, this great covenant, the new covenant, and that we would all be saved under it. The point is that it, men can't save men. We can't save ourselves by offering up the blood of bulls and goats and sheep and all those things. So the Old Testament system actually succeeded because its goal was not to save us, but to show us we needed a Savior. That's the whole point. And so that was the purpose of it. And so number eight is this. The Old Testament system was, intended, was not intended to save, but to show that we needed a once-for-all-time Savior. The plan was ultimately that God would save His people through the sacrifice of His own Son. That this once-for-all-time sacrifice would cover His people's sins forever, and that Jesus would reign as the high priest and king forever. So don't look at the Old Testament and think, those times were better, I wish I lived then. Because what we live under now is the, is the better covenant. It is the best covenant. Because we're under the great high priest. And we serve the great king. And under him is the only way that we can be saved. No person was ever saved through the death of an animal. It's only through the blood of the Son, faith in Christ, that we can be saved. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your eternal plan that you sent your Son to die on the cross for us so that we could be made right with you. But not just to leave us there, but that He rose from the dead so that we could have eternal life. And He rose and ascended to sit at Your right hand where He intercedes for us now until the time of His return. Lord, we praise You for that. We praise You, Lord, for all of the, the shadows and types in the Old Testament that point ahead, that show us and point to us that Jesus is better. Lord, I pray that You would help us to understand that as we read through our Bibles, as we read the book of Leviticus and wonder what all of these things mean and how they apply to us. Lord, let us at least take away that truth, that Jesus is better than all of those ceremonies and sacrifices. Lord, we praise You for that. We praise You for Your Son. We thank You, Lord, for all that You do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.